Listen up, pedal pushers. From Black Magic Clutches, your top source of stick shift innovation. From ratios to records, here's your Black Magic Clutches host, the applied pressure professor, Kale Aronson, and the mother of clutches, Kenzie Aronson. So let's dive in the clutch can and let the clutch dust fly. Hey guys, welcome to all of my fellow coordinated left leg using racers. The guys who actually bang the gears and pay attention to what they're doing going down the racetrack instead of ride along program. Of course, everybody says stick shift racing's dead, but that's why we're all here tonight. So, and I'm sure that's why everybody's going to be here for a long time to kill them. Uh, tuning all, all, everything we're doing when it comes to tuning about a clutch car, everybody has to understand there's a lot that goes into it. However, it's what allows us to show up at the racetrack and change anything that we want to change without having to throw a different slush box in it or change everything. We actually have everything we need. Um, it gives a lot of opportunities that everybody else doesn't have. The difference with it is, is obviously, um, the best way to explain this is a lot of people call up, they're starting to get into the stick shift type racing for the first time, or they've been using the diaphragm or something and kind of learning you know, the stick shift stuff. Maybe they're just a little bit younger. As they get into basically this um, you know, ability to be able to tune, to be able to change what they've got, a lot of guys go, you know, I don't really think I'm going to need a data logger or I'm really not going to need to get in there and change it. I don't want to mess with it. And almost every single time, as soon as they figure out they've got that knob or they've got that switch, they're a fellow pro stock person immediately, which means the more switches you give us, the more buttons you give us, the more things we can turn, flip or push, we're going to try it because it's something else to do. Obviously, after a little bit of time, that's why we use three pedals and we use our right hand to actually do something um, is because we're wired for it. We're out here to drive, to enjoy it, to do everything there is to do it. It's not just about getting in and, you know, stroking your checkbook. Tonight, what we're going to really cover, we're going to talk about, and later on, I'll encourage people to go ahead and write in or call in. We'll have some different opportunities. Uh, what we're going to cover is really understanding applied pressure with friction coefficient and what we're really trying to do with that. Um, I want to take a little bit of a second, kind of like I always do every time we do our clutch tuning seminars um, and things like that in person, is to take a second and kind of explain the very basics between for everybody out there who's not used to working with different types of clutches. And of course, what I mean by that is like a diaphragm or an old Borgen Beck, which is basically what a lot of people will determine or call a uh, basically an on off switch is what we use in layman's terms. The on off switch is basically said that because it has it's using nothing but static pressure. Static pressure is also sometimes referred to as base pressure. Um, so that static or base pressure means that that's built into the springs. Now that could be obviously with the long style or the Borgen Beck or even a pro billet style clutch. That's where we're using a coil spring to establish that large amount of pressure. Um, now that being said, we, that's the same thing with the diaphragm is it's using a diaphragm spring. And the second you release it, all of that's hitting just immediately versus when you're using something that uses centrifugal force or applied pressure that's done through RPM, obviously down the road in future episodes, we'll do stuff that has to do with lockup clutches and get into that. However, that's not exactly um, the optimal way to tune something. A lot of times people will get on the phone with me and after they've, uh, they'll say, hey, you know, I've been running a stick shift car uh, with a long style for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and then, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to get them, for me to get them to change how they're tuning it. Uh, the big reason of what the big thing that I want them to change has to do with the ability to use counterweight and become what I call counterweight dependent. Um, different applications will require different things. Uh, to explain that a little bit better, I like to use our Mountain Motor Pro Stock stuff because it's kind of an even number that you can use to understand why this is tuned differently. So on a twin 10 inch Mountain Motor Pro Stock deal, for example, I mean, an average number to look at would be about 6,000 pounds of plate load pressure per square inch is what it takes to lock it up. Um, of course, you're talking about a 24, 24, 50 pound car making about 2,000 horsepower, and we're shifting at about 82. The thing with that is, is we launch the lower RPM, and when we drop the clutch, obviously we have enough horsepower torque to weight ratio to immediately accelerate that. 
uh, you're not going to see like a stock eliminator car where you're revving it up and you may be shifting at 7,200 and you're almost launching up there as well. That's a different cat, a whole different ball game. So what we have to look at is with the mountain motor stuff or like a pro billet, it's a little bit easier to understand it there to take it to work it backwards. And so what I mean by that is, is we lock up about 7,200 RPM at 7,200 RPM, about a thousand pounds of that will come from the base pressure. The rest of it, the other 5,000 are going to come from the counterweight. So what that means is, is at relatively low RPM, it's not, the pressure's not, there's not very much pressure at all. The more RPM you get, the more ex, like, ex, exaggerated that's going to get. So what that allows us to do is drive into that pressure. So obviously a lot of ever, a lot of people have been watching the small tire stick shifts type stuff for quite a while. That's getting a little bit more, uh, a little more popular and it's getting everybody starting to realize that what they didn't think they could do five or 10, 20, 30 years ago, they're realizing they're doing on, you know, they might be doing on radials. They might be doing 28, 10 fives. They might be doing it on IRS. They might be doing the stock style transmission with crazy horsepower. It's not all about what can and cannot be done. It has to do with working with the tools, what you have. So, what we want to do is I'm going to jump right in here tonight, um, basically to let everybody know that what we're going to look at is looking at applied pressure and how it works with a race pack graph information. So I'm going to bring some race pack graphs up and I'm going to show you guys some different stuff here in a little bit um, versus basically like maybe some, some lower horsepower stuff and compare it to some of our, our higher horsepower stuff. I'll probably actually use some of our old pro stock runs just to give you an idea because we have more sensors and more stuff on that that I have no problem sharing that information with the world. Um, so basically, but I wanna jump in right now. We've got a, a presentation here that we're gonna start. Um, so let me get that up for you. And what we're gonna do is walk through this information. Um, basically, let's see here. Okay, we should have you guys everything. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at basically understanding applied clutch pressure. So understanding applied clutch pressure is going to be uh, relative to also, like I said, friction coefficient. So to understand this concept, basically, understand that the more friction coefficient that you have, um, the less applied pressure you need. The more, so, and it works obviously in, in opposite. So to start off with, what we're talking about, the traditional diaphragm or Borg and Brett clutch, there's a built-in amount of static pressure. Basically, you can shim that pressure plate up, you can shim that pressure plate down, you can add base pressure, but that means the second you drop that clutch, if it, let's say a, a, an average diaphragm or Borg and Beck style clutch is going to apply, depending on how it's set up, let's say on average, 2,400, 2,800 pounds. That means you get 24 to 2,800 pounds right now. The second that foot drops, that's what you get. Now, obviously, there's what I call the clutch shamer. Everybody else, of course, does too. Um, yes, it can band-aid a situation. Your problem is, is why does it not go quicker, faster, work as good as, say, our adjustable stuff? And the reason is it's harder on parts because you're controlling the slippage, meaning the movement of the pressure plate to the disc, which is eliminating your air gap. And as it moves there, it's slowly engaging the disc. Well, what we really need to have happen is we need that, that to make an immediate contact. When it makes an immediate contact, it automatically, let's say um, at 5,000 RPM, we may have uh, 500 pounds of static base pressure. We may be running, let's just say for, uh, you know, for speculation, say 36 grams of counterweight uh, on a long style type clutch. That 36 grams of counterweight at 5,000 RPM may be only giving you somewhere in the neighborhood of about 600 pounds of pressure. So you say, okay, at 5,000 RPM, I've got 600 pounds of pressure coming from my counterweight. I have 500 pounds of pressure coming from my base and you add them together, you have 1,100. Well, let's say we know 1100 is not going to be enough pressure to lock that up. You know, we're going to need more like 1800. Well, from say you're shifting this car, let's say around 8,000. So that means from 5,000, 8,000, it's going to gain more pressure. And we're going to want to target that 1800 pounds of pressure somewhere, obviously about 1200, say 14, 1500 RPM before shift point. And that's going to, where we determine that shift point is going to be different between a four speed or a five speed big time. Because obviously a four-speed has a lot bigger gear drops. And in having bigger gear drops, it's going to drop lower. When it drops lower in the gear change, that's going to also give it an ability to slip the clutch more because it loses that RPM. So that's why you'll see with five-speed applications, they are more advantageous than a four-speed, not only just because you obviously have better ratio and better leverage to the track, but you also have the ability to now tune the clutch in more precisely to what you want. Um, moving on, you know, the... A lot of people call these clutches, and it's not my term, um, is a slipper clutch. 
the, you know, I always preferred adjustable versus slipper. But that being said, um, you know, what it basically does is it allows you to leave with a lower amount of pressure, slipping the clutch, and allows you to lock it up at a higher RPM through the use of counterweight. Um, a lot of people who aren't used to these style clutches, I'm pretty sure most of our guys on here, and I noticed before the show that we had some of our, as they call themselves, and I won't call you that, is our senior citizens. I saw, uh, like say, saw that we have the awareness motorsports guys on there and Dom McClure and a few others. Um, but they all, these guys have been doing it for years. But we do have guys out here that do not even, you know, they get a new clutch. They literally don't know where to bolt the counterweight on. The counterweight goes to the outside edge on a long style clutch. So if you're looking at a long style, which is what most of you guys are probably using, um, if you're using an adjustable. Basically, those levers can be balanced and we can move the, the ramp rate, which means how quick or how slowly that pressure actually comes in. But by adding counterweight to the outside, literally a three gram change, if everything's set up right, three grams will make an actual difference when you look at it on a logger. So a lot of guys out here are not used to loggers. They don't really, you know, they, yeah, that's, a lot of times, hey, that's a future purchase. That's something I'm going to do down the road. Or, hey, I'm too old to do it. Or, hey, whatever the reason is. It doesn't matter. Tune by to see your pants is still a heck of a lot better than these guys, like say, out here riding the automatic slush box train down the, down the drag strip. So, kudos. That being said, tonight I really want to take a little bit of time to show everybody what that actually means when we're getting into the race pack graphs, what you look for, and how simple it actually is once you figure out all the details. So, moving on, um, basically, we're going to start talking friction coefficients. So, before I go into this slide, the thing I'd like to mention here is I started to go down earlier. Most of our stuff, as you guys know, we use centered iron materials. And the most common basic materials out there are obviously the, the big three, um, which is 5135. Everybody refers to that as the soft compound. It's the most friction coefficients you can get. And then you have the 5050 in the middle, followed by 5191. 5191 is what you're going to see in most of your pro mod, pro stock, top fuel, that type, multi-disc applications. Uh, we have a lot of compounds available to us that we work with that are somewhere in between it's not just one or the other so we don't have to live there although those are the three that most people are the most familiar with most door cars single disc stuff for the most part aside from a lot of our stock eliminator type cars or lower horsepower to weight ratio cars uh, some of those we have special compounds that we put into that are they're more between a 50 50 and a 51 91 and the, the reason for that generally is because um, we end up not being able to use very much applied pressure with these guys um, and so when we can't use very much applied pressure, that really causes us to have to back everything down and not give us that tuning window that we want to have. So by reducing the friction coefficient, it allows us to add more base, more counterweight, which obviously just opens our tuning window. So one of the most annoying things to me out there, and I'm sure if there's any of my 500 inch, uh, you know, fellow brethren that might, uh, you know, sign in or listen to this at some point, it's the reason why we work with a lot of the teams. Um, you know, to do custom lever design, whether it be with the old East or the old East West or the, you know, the Leanders are currently most to run the 6.6 Bonifani. Uh, we rework those very commonly with our clutch dyno and stuff. But, you know, it's kind of funny. I know that I saw, a, you know, a video that they posted a while back and I think everybody's probably familiar with. And you look and you say they got, you know, they got, they're putting weight on every other lever instead of every lever. Um, basically what that means is, is the lever geometry and the weights and things like that are not really optimal to where they need to be. So that's why we redesign that and work with our fulcrum points, pivot points. We change the ramp rate so that we can control how fast or slow or how much you, you know counterweight you're using. And the reason for that is you don't want to be down on a car like that turning, uh, you know, say 10,500 to 11,000, anything in between, let's say 10 and 11,000, uh, and be where you're like, okay, I literally only have, you know, 15 or 20 grams of counterweight under. You would a lot rather be 40, 50 grams of counterweight total because your window is way bigger. If you're off by six grams, running 60 grams, that's, you know, you're off 10%. You're off six grams running 18%, you know, grams total, you're off 30%. That's a little bit bigger of a change. Okay, so. Okay, so basically the thing I wanna talk about with our, um, with Clutch's ability to hold going back is friction coefficient. Um, you know, what we want to look at here is um, with, with the friction coefficient, a disc has different ways of with calculating that. The, the best way to calculate that is you got to look at different discs can have different, obviously, outside diameter. You can be a 10 inch, a 10 and a half, 11, 12, whatever, but you also have to look at the inside diameter. So looking at the inside diameter is, it is a really important part here. So a lot of guys you'll see, and I'm sure a lot of you guys out there who have had long styles that you've gotten from you know, some of the older clutch companies out there, 
you'll get one that has an in, you know somebody's undersized a disc in it or something like that trying to take that friction coefficient away or they'll back cut it or something like that it is an okay band-aid if you're at the track but it's not the proper way to do it long term what i mean by that is we need to match our friction materials together if you're going to run a 10 inch disc with a six inch id the heat shields need to match that if at all possible that's going to make the wear be a lot flatter a lot longer it's also basically going to allow you to like for example where we have different types of heat shields most of the stuff that you'll see that comes from black magic or people we work with will be a segmented style heat shield versus um you know the rivet on style now we have rivet on styles that we um you know basically upgrade for when people send them in and stuff like the older style that we go from say the original most of them are 140 thousandths thick we step it up to a quarter inch thick when we do that obviously we got to you know accommodate for some some ring height some hat height things like that for tight bell housing but the long story short we have ways of doing that to bring it up this is actually good timing uh we had a question just came in from bill armstrong you know, he's asking basically, you know, how does the floater plate on a twin disc handle the heat? So that is a little bit of a, uh, a multi, a question that can kind of be answered in multiple ways. And what I mean by that is it depends on what kind of clutch we're having in it, what the floater is, is the floater bare steel? Is it a bronze or metallic type or is it something coated? I'm mean, knowing Bill well enough, I'm going to go on a shot here and say that Bill's probably talking both about, you know, the diaphragm stuff that he's used to as well as the long style. When we go into floater plates, a floater plate has several things that can be uh, brought out that can be, you can actually see a lot of telltale signs on what's wrong with the clutch when a floater, when there's something wrong uh, through the floater plate. And the reason I say that is, is a lot of times we actually have a, a, a customer right now, a Tanner Bosnelli, who is actually working right now with one of his older ones that he just had to open up and clearance some on, the, on one of the older uh, units uh, that's one of the other manufacturers, uh, basically because they encompass the entire stand that it goes on so instead of it having a lug that has one on each side of the stand driv driving it it basically has any you know hole that goes all the way around it the problem with it is is as they get hotter and they get colder you end up with expansion and contraction which obviously is going to take me backwards into talking about our heat shields so that's why we segment heat shields versus put one piece rivet on is because when you have a rivet on heat shield especially with say an aluminum flywheel or aluminum pressure plate and then we have a high grade metal, you know, metal on the, for a, you know, steel for basically the heat shield um, with a brass or a steel rivet. And brass is actually better long term. Yes, the steel will hold it tighter. Your problem with it is, is sometimes the steel actually doesn't let things give that you wish would have given. Um, but basically, you have three different metals that are expanding and contracting at different rates. So a floater would be a good example of that. The floater is in the middle. And, you know, if the clutch is running a little bit on the tight side, the floater is going to be just fine. You won't see anything. When you start really slipping a clutch and you start kind of pushing its uh, limits uh, or getting it up to what it could do, uh, getting the most potential out of it, you're going to find that the, the floater is going to take a lot of heat. Um, but that being said, that's also that floater is usually a really good spot to see if one side is starting to wear more than the other side or you're starting to get cuppage, which means you'll start to see it wear on the inside or the outside a little bit more. That's really a good place to kind of keep an eye on what you've got going on there. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot to look into, but what this takes us back to is, is like, say is the friction coefficient that inside diameter, outside diameter. The worst thing you can do is not match a, um, you know, not match your IDs and your ODs and things like that. That'll actually cause premature, you know, wear and things like that. So, Oh, while there is, All right, so we've uh, say if anybody wants any questions, please feel free to go ahead and pop in there and let them go while we're going at any time. We'll get them piped into us and we'll take them as we go. Uh, we're going to have a lot of that going on here. Uh, and like I said, we're going to try to get through the bulk of basically our presentation. And then like I say, what we'll do is we'll fit them in as they go, especially when they align with the, the subject that we're talking about. And then we can kind of keep going. But I encourage those, that, like I say, come on in. Tinsy will be fielding those and bring them in to me as we go. So back to our friction coefficient situation. Um, Basically, the more area per square inch that you have by utilizing that extra, that area, basically you're going to up your friction coefficient. Obviously, you can de decrease it, but we can also do this with different materials. And the best way to put it is that's where we'd rather have a less. A lot of times, we don't want too much friction coefficient. Too much friction coefficient backs your tuning window down way too far and keeps you from getting where you need to be. So that's where using these different materials, which I, I do want to touch on this for one second. Um, a lot of you guys that are used to street style clutches. Um, understand you're used to using what I refer to as fiber style materials. 
And what I mean by that is whether it be a organic or it be a Kevlar or it be a carbon or anything along those lines, they're really not designed to slip. They're, they're designed to hold. And so a lot of these clutch companies that are running, di they're building diaphragm stuff. You know, they'll tell you how much they can hold. They, you know, and they, they've got all their marketing and their stages and things like that. But understand that really what you're doing when you're going from something like that to something like what we do in the adjustable world, um, and obviously we do them all, I mean, but in the adjustable world, what we're really co covering here is we have different materials that we can change and we don't build any one clutch just with an off the shelf thing. We take everybody's, you know, combination into account when we do this because we want to make sure that you have a tuning window to begin with. Um, so basically what you got to look at is, is everything we're doing here is nothing but a balance. And this is what I'll, I, I'm sure half my customers have heard me say this is we basically tell everybody, you know, every clutch, no matter what is simply an amount of applied pressure over a friction coefficient. So moving on, basically we got to look at the two things like say is base pressure and counterweight. Um, you know, this is something to bring out. We had another question come in that is basically, um, you know, basically this, what we're really going to touch is slipper clutches is what they like call an adjustable clutch versus a street clutch. Uh, you know, what the differences are. Do we do a lot of either one, you know, where we go to things like that. So what I want to look at is here is for an example, we do do a lot of uh, adjustable clutches on the, on the street. Um, you know, if you're not going to be putting 10,000, 20,000 miles a year, it's not a daily driver type clutch. And the reason for that's not because necessarily it's drivability or anything like that. It has to do with the material is literally just made to be gone through. It's it's made to be slipped. That being said, if you put a single centered iron, you know, single disc, 10 and a half, 11 inch clutch, something like that into a street car making five, six, 800 horsepower, um, you can tune it to where the thing's locked up all the time. But you can also change it when you get to the racetrack and say, hey, I'm going to take my base, my counterweight, we cut it in half, we get it to where it operates different. So I've had this conversation many a times in the last, you know, uh, probably months or years, uh, but it's become a little bit more, more uh, brought out here in the last several months. But basically the thing you have to understand is when you have one of these style clutches, you don't run it the same on the street as you would run it on the racetrack. So if you were made, if your clutch was set up, for example, to run, uh, you know, launch at 5,000 RPM, shift at 8,000 RPM, uh, basically it's not made to operate below 5,000. So your counterweight is being taken into account there. So if you've got, you know, let's say you've got 36 grams of total counterweight on this thing and two turns of base pressure, uh, which let's just say that adds up at, you know, 1200 RPM, just up somewhere around the idle or just off of it, um, you're going to find out real quick that basically that's not very much pressure. Yeah, if you could, will drive the car like you're going to put it down to Sonic for a drive through, you're fine. But if you're going to uh, basically jump all over this thing uh, and you're going to, you know, sit be rolling along at 20, 30 miles an hour and you're just going to put your foot to the wood, you can out accelerate the clutch. Now, that doesn't mean the clutch won't hold it. It just means there's a difference between your racetrack setup and going out and playing on the street. But once again, if you're going to drive to a local car show and you're not going to be horsing around, uh, you know, being a hoon, you're fine. There's not a problem with that at all. We do a lot of the – obviously, we do a lot of diaphragm stuff too. We have, we've got a lot of our guys that have the diaphragms that we've customized. We work with a lot of the other clutch companies as well to do this because a lot of times there's not really a reason to reinvent the wheel and basically, which means jump all the way down into somebody's pocketbook to do this. A lot of times that's where we take it. And we say, this is something that by modifying a pressure plate, by modifying some disc materials and some floaters and some spacers, things like that, we can put you right in where you need to be. So what we're really doing is modifying the friction coefficient with its, with its applied pressure. So to hit with this slide, basically base pressure, once again, we went over this as static pressure. Um, and this is something that you can do that's not affected by RPM. Whatever you put in there, it's there all the time. Counterweight, on the other hand, is affected very dramatically by RPM. So that's what allows you to slip the clutch at one RPM and let it lock up at another. The biggest thing a lot of guys don't understand with this style clutch, especially when they're, I guess you'd say, the you know, be noobs, uh, they're new to this stuff, um, is they don't understand when we start tuning a clutch this way, shift RPM becomes very, very, very important. You can't short stick it by 500 or 800 or one of my customers recently was more than 1,000. You know, and, and it's basically one of these things where, especially like if, say, you're going into high gear where you might have a larger gear drop. So it's the percentages aren't exactly equal. So what happens is if you short shift that, it's going to knock the clutch out of it. So it's not really that the clutch doesn't have the ability to hold it. It has to do with all of a sudden being coming counterweight dependent means you need to hit your shift points. But by hitting your shift points, that's very important 
uh, for getting a lot more performance because basically what we're doing is we're allowing that clutch to slip a little bit at the bottom of all the gear changes, which keeps you from having a large spike in the tire, which I'm going to bring that up here after a little while uh, on some of our pro stock style graphs where you'll be able to see kind of what our um, drive shaft RPM looks like in a gear change versus what others do. So this is some, this, I'm just going to go over some basic charts here that everybody can see. This is some almost all of our, uh, you know, all of our customers uh, get with, you know, with their clutches they have access to. Um, and what this is, is this, for example, is going to be on like a 10 and a half or our 11 inch long style type clutch. Um, it's a basic 360 pound spring at zero pounds of pressure. What I'm going to warn everybody listening, because it just, I just hope this shortens my phone conversations a little bit, um, is basically that these clutches, um, that you get from some of the older manufacturers been out there for a long time, uh, older builders. A lot of times they'll tell you it's, uh, you know, so much is zero. It's a lot lower than that. The problem with it is a lot of times it's not whether you blueprint it, meaning we go backwards to see what it is, meaning we reverse engineer it, so to speak, or we clamp to the dyno. It's usually significantly more. Um, so what you've got to look at there is um, we have to get right. So, you don't want to have so much static pressure built into a clutch that you can't get the job done, that you can't get enough out of it. At the same time, you don't want it set up so low with really big jumps. Our stuff is very low jumps, meaning a quarter turn of base is a very minute, which by the screen you can tell. Let's say we went from a quarter turn of base, which is you know 368 pounds up to 387. So we're making a very, very, very small, you know, about an 18 and a half pound jump per quarter turn of base. But what I want you to look at this is, is this is how you know how much pressure you have at any given time. Because once we start looking at the race pack graphs, what we're going to be able to do is refer back to these style, these, you know, these spreadsheets and these uh, graphs to be able to look and say, how much pressure do I have at any given time? So once you know this, if you go to a race pack graph or a logger, let's say you have an RPM logger or a Holly or whoever you might have, um, this is why this comes in very handy because we can see at the point it locks up. Once we know when it locks up, we know exactly how much pressure it took to do that. So uh, this is moving on. This is our counterweight sheet. So what this allows us to do basically is, you know, we don't, the, the top row uh, where it's is grams total, you can use that, but that's really more of a cheat thing just so you can get a better idea for a quick glance. The column to the left obviously is your RPM. The column beside it is pounds per gram. So what that means is if you're running, once again, say 36 pounds per gram, and you're launching at, on this, I would say 6,000 RPM, that'd be 21.78 pounds per gram. So if you have 36 grams on there at 6,000 RPM, you would multiply 36 grams times 21.78. That would give you the total amount of pressure applied at 6,000 RPM through counterweight. Then you would simply go back, and we'll just flip back, and add your base pressure. So you'd say, okay, I'm running two turns of base. So you would find out what that number is and add 498 pounds and know that your counterweight plus your base is what it takes to lock it up. So if you want to slip that clutch for 200 RPM longer or you want to lock it up 200 RPM earlier, it's really easy to do that. So all you have to do is do the math to figure out, let's say that number came up to around 1,800 pounds. You just move that number, that 1,800 pound pressure number, wherever you need it. But... We'll move in. We'll talk about this a little later. The thing that you can do at any given time is divide these numbers to figure out your percentage of pressure at launch and at lockup. So what I mean by that is if you say launch at 5,000, lockup at say 7,000, obviously your percentage of base pressure to counterweight will be higher at a lower RPM, but your base pressure will present less percentage at a higher RPM because the counterweight is going to take over with more and more and more. So skip for, uh, back ahead. We'll go up here. We're going to start looking at the graph information. Now, that being said, we're going to get into the actual race pack here shortly. Uh, but this is just an idea of what I want you to look at once we get there. Um, let's see here. Basically, what I want to say here, you're going to be able to see uh, a launch RPM, which is set at approximately about 6,200 RPM. Um, if, if we say that clutch has about two and a half turns and we're going to say 36 grams of counterweight, that's 12 grams per lever um, using the base chart back we went, it would have said about 535 pounds of pressure. At 6,200 RPM and 36 grams counterweight applied, that's 24.66 pounds per gram. So that gives us 887 pounds of pressure, okay, through counterweight. So what you'll see is we're adding the 888 uh, or 87, sorry, uh, pounds of pressure plus the 535 to see that we get 1,422 pounds at 6,200 RPM. 
So the place to kind of, to basically um, look at this is going to be, if you can see, is gonna be right where our drive shaft, which is in blue, comes up to our red line, which is engine RPM. And on any of the race pack stuff, and we'll get into it a little later, you'll always see in the top, hand, the, the top will be where you can actually look up and reference what color means what, it'll be matched to it. By clicking on those, you can change which color they are by just randomly cycling through it. But this gives you an idea of how we achieve uh, what kind of pressure it took to lock it up. Let's see here, moving on. Basically, um, let's see if we can switch out here. Okay. Okay, now what we're gonna look at is, uh, you can look at lar that the lockup RPM was approximately 8,400 RPM, was the actual lockup RPM. So to go back to the previous slide, what we would've been talking about was, that was 6,200, which was launch. So what you can look at is 1,422 pounds of pressure at launch. And we basically did the same math here, and you could read through the slide, basically saying that we had the same amount of base, same amount of counterweight, because it's obviously the same run, but it's obviously the counterweight is applying uh, 1,905 pounds of pressure as opposed to the 887 of the previous. So basically, we have exponentially added, you know, added pressure to this to gain the lockup. So what it is is now it's 1,905 pounds plus 535 to give you a total of 2,440. You know, and actually, I apologize. I just noticed we had 6,200 RPM instead of 84, so that was a typo. However, that is 8,400 RPMs where you're gaining that pressure. So that's your lockup RPM. So what that tells us now is it took 2,440 pounds of pressure to lock that clutch up at 8,400. So what I want you to kind of pay attention to on this particular, um, this particular graph is, you can see how the engine RPM actually goes up, lays over, and comes back in. The, prob the reason for that is actually a gear ratio thing, and it's not being able to continue the movement of the tire. The, the thing that most people underestimate, or I, mean, I don't know if it's the right, right terminology of underestimate or don't quite uh, wrap their heads around, is part of what you do with a clutch is you're really trying to control wheel speed. A properly, anytime you see a car that launches, that obviously a lot of times you go to the local bracket tracks, you'll see that they got a big, big tire on it. They stick the tire. The thing does no revolutions upon launch other than literally just, you know, staying completely hooked up. That's basically where you're losing a lot, you know, in clutch tuning. Our job is really to control the clutch slippage um, of this, you know, more than anything else. So... Moving on, what we're going to now look at is, so basically what we were just talking about, so it's 6,200 versus 8,400. We went from 1,422 pounds to 2,440 pounds. So over the course of about 2,200 RPM, we gained, you know, significantly, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about, you know, 45 percentage more than what we had at the beginning. So here you can look at, see that what we had to get there at each, uh, you know, at each pressure. So at launch, we had 1,422. At lockup, we had 2,440. Um, and what I want you to look at, I talked about earlier was the percentages. Notice that the base pressure at 6,200, which is launch, is only is making up 37.6 of the total applied pressure. While at, at 8,400, which is lockup, it's dropped down to only making about 21.9 or 22 you know, percent. So what that is, is now you can see that the, the counterweight has made up for that. That's one of the most important things to look at. So we actually have another question that came in. And uh, so basically, you know, I, I was asked, which is our favorite yellow SN95 twin turbo Mustang out there? And I really don't know like how to really answer that question, but I will here in a little bit um, because I have one of their crew members over here, uh, basically right beside, you know, beside me that uh, I think he might be a little biased on that. So we'll, we'll check in with our crew member here in a little bit on that. So um, basically to look at here, we're going back to our pressure at launch RPM versus lockup. And I want to talk about setting the zero, um, what that is. And we're going to do it real time on the race pack graph, but on the bottom left-hand side of any of them, you'll see a little green circle with a T in it. And basically what that means is that's where you zero. That's start point of the run, because a lot of guys don't know how to actually start that time or give it as a, to set it to zero. And that's very important so that we can look at the other stuff that's more important. So we know exactly at what point of the run, everything happened. So basically how to set that uh, to begin with, you're gonna put your cursor on the screen and we're gonna move over slightly until we see that first drive shaft RPM move. So it's usually gonna be setting at a, at a low static number and then all of a sudden it makes one big jump. The first time it makes a big jump, you're just gonna take your arrow key and click it back to the left. And we're gonna do that live here in just a little bit so that you understand exactly how to do that. 
Uh, but that's very important because that's what we're going to start now talking about is why we want to control that clutch pressure at any given time. So like I said, that's our biggest important factor uh, is controlling the clutch pressure to control wheel speed. Using your arrow button, basically uh, you push the right arrow key until you get it. Uh, this is once again going over that, but I want you to notice that the clutch slippage is happening early, and then that's what you're going to be seeing. You can actually see how that clutch slippage overlays with that drive shaft RPM. What we're looking at there is, I want to go actually go back. I want you to look, what we're looking at is at a quarter second in. We're going to do that live in just a second on the actual race pack graph. But basically, at a quarter second, we're looking at drive shaft RPM. The drive shaft RPM is about, on here is about 999. On this particular car, that's actually pretty good. But what you're going to find is once you find that best 60 foot time that you can get, um, basically that's where you're going to start targeting these numbers. You're going to start looking at a quarter second of drive shaft RPM and a half second of drive shaft RPM. So at a half second of drive shaft RPM here, you'll be able to see, basically we've gone from 999 up to 2200. That's actually a pretty significant jump. That's pretty, that's quite a bit. So, but what we have to look at is, is the biggest problem is, is what I'm seeing on this particular graph is why the drive shaft RPM stays low and then takes over. It's also, you can see it really jumps up and flat lines and it lays over in the drive shaft RPM at the same time that the clutch RPM is almost going to full lockup. So this particular run on this car was actually a really good 60 foot. However, there was still quite a bit left. The clutch itself in the graph, you can see there's no separation between the gear changes. It's a little bit on the tight side and could have been a little bit, a little bit better. Also looking at the drive, basically what we should have done with this car would have been giving it more gear ratio, uh, or sorry, taking gear ratio away from it, but launching the car a little bit harder. Basically what it boils down to is a lot of people have heard the term gear bound. You can see this so much in cars like this whenever you're uh, looking at it from a starting line application. So anytime you see the clutch come in and jerk it down like that really, really quickly, it basically means that we're, we really don't have the amount of applied pressure that we want in there. And so what actually helps us is to take a, take ratio away from the car, but use RPM. Because if we could have launched this car at about 500 RPM higher, it would have actually really helped us with the clutch tuning. And we would have been able to run a little bit le more, or a little bit less clutch, even more than where we're at to get to the same point, And it would have been a more efficient run. Um, so real quick, touch on the load of the load, understanding the load on the clutch. Um, the load on the clutch is very important to look at. That's car weight, that's horsepower, RPM ratio, suspension, tire size, tire pressure, friction coefficient of the materials, um, the clutch assembly itself, on and on. Uh, basically, it's a combination. Um, if a combination isn't appropriate uh, in other aspects of the car, it's basically going to make the tuning of the clutch almost impossible or way more difficult. Um, this is why we constantly work with our customers, you know, in all aspects to make sure they have all their gearing right, the suspensions right, because if all that's not right, it's really, it's hard to get the clutch where you need it to be. So, you know, here we're given an example of your first gear times your rear gear is obviously your starting line ratio. But let's say, you know, this customer has a 15.47, but they need to be closer to 14.75. Basically, that allows us, you know, it'll require lower launch RPM to get by with the 1547 and probably have a harder time getting the applied pressure low enough. So by lowering the, uh, the you know, basically the gear ratio or basically making the load on the clutch greater, it allows us to run more pressure to lock it up versus, so that's where a lot of times somebody says, I, you know, they're putting an undersized disc in or things like that. A lot of times we'll actually find that they've actually got too much gear ratio in the car or too much tire or something along those lines, which is basically whatever they're doing is not putting the load on the clutch that it needs to be. Um, so I want to look at this real quick. This is a quick compare chart, just a, you know, obviously there's a lot more factors that can go into this, but reasons for less load on the clutch versus reasons for more load on the clutch. Obviously, whichever one's in the left column is the opposite of the right column. So if you have, if you, you know, there's not enough load, the, if you don't have any load on the clutch, it means you probably have too much ratio. Too much load in the clutch really simply means you're not running very much base and counterweight. That could actually be two things. You don't have load on the clutch or you got too much clutch. But if let's say your clutch selection for friction coefficient is okay, it usually would mean you have too much ratio. Uh, you're launching the car too hard, lack of weight transfer, the shocks are too stiff on the compression, basically anything you can think of that doesn't put that load on the clutch. Um, you know, the other thing is, which we'll get into in way later, um, you know, discussions is going to be like looking at instant center for link and plotting and things like that. Because the, the general consent, the, the easy way to kind of probably hit on this is basically looking at instant center. Instant center is basically when a top bar above the rear end makes intersect going towards the front of the car with the lower frame rail. 
in the easiest statements, I guess, of the terms. And basically, the further you move that out, the easier, you know, you're basically going to be able to pull the tires. And the closer you bring it back, the, the harder it will be to pull the front tires. So if you look at it, the further you lay, the, the easier it is to pick the front tires, um, basically that's more load there is on the clutch because you're transferring more weight to the back tire, which means it doesn't slip, it doesn't spin, it plants, it goes. So there's a terms of less bite, more bite. But in the instance, basically, let's say, if the instant center is too short, then basically you're taking the load off the clutch because it now makes the tire easy to spin and vice versa if you're working the other way. Uh, so real quick, the friction coefficient versus applied pressure. Um, there's a constant balance. That's the whole point of this conversation. You know, the friction coefficient is simply calculated by the amount of resistance that's provided by the disc, the disc material, uh, their friction material or the plates, the wear plates on each side, which we can refer to as a heat shield, um, as well as the floater. The applied pressure is something that comes from either the static pressure or the counterweight itself, which is affected by RPM. And basically, the more friction coefficient used, the less applied pressure you'll need and vice versa. When the friction efficient coefficient gets too high for an application, the amount of applied pressure will be too low. And when you get down to zero turns of base and you have almost no counterweight on there, your tuning window goes to non-existent. And that's where we need to change something to get you, you know, whether it be changing to a different disc material or anything like that. Uh, but there's ways to get there. So the long story short is it's you're not always, you know, sometimes you have to change other things on the car versus it always being, you know, on the clutch. But that being said, it's all a work in progress. And the thing I always give examples, I always talk about pro cars is because let's face it, you see any of us, anybody that's ever gone to the lanes in a pro deal, uh, the, the, the covers off the can uh, till the parent front he's making a run because that's the last decision we make is whether or not we button that thing up to make the last minute change. So gear ratio has been determined uh, off of the weather, the track conditions, things like that. We're now making the last minute changes off the clutch. So what I mean by bringing that up Core link is not determined five minutes before the run. Gear ratios wasn't made five minutes before the run. That clutch, that launch RPM, those things, that's the last thing. So if everything else behind it is way off, it's going to be really hard for the clutch to do its job. So that's why it's important that we go over so many of the details with our customers. And that's what I enjoy doing because to me, it's important for you guys to have the right stuff the first time, especially so you're not you know, spending money twice. Uh, worst thing, I hate you know adding insult to injury and putting good money after bad at any given time. Um, so basically what I'm saying here is it's very important to understand when you're selecting a clutch, you know, what is the most important from friction coefficient to applied pressure, why that balance is so important and knowing where your, where your tuning point or your tuning window needs to be um, so that you basically can control your point of lockup. Another point we want to make is clutch durability. Um, so we do a lot of different features, like we, I brought up a little bit ago, different heat shields, different things to try to add. The longer a clutch can wear flat, the more consistent it's going to be. Hence why we've got the segment heat shields. Hence why we have different friction materials. We do different things along those lines. But that's why a lot of our customers, you know, especially, especially and we'll bring up, you know, some of them later, that they can get, you know, they get a lot of runs um, and the clutch is doing the same thing over a long period of time, even with wear, is simply because the disc is not losing contact surface. Same time any of these guys, I'm sure you guys have taken them apart out there, um, and they eat after 20, 30, 40, 50 runs, you see it, and the disc has lost 30% of its contact area. And obviously, if you've taken away 30% of friction coefficient, you're applying a significant amount of counterweight or base pressure um, to get it back. And that's not something you want to do because then you're constantly chasing it, chasing the tune up. And that's not what you want to do. So basically, it's also important to get a proper balance of base and counterweight for an application uh, so that you can control that rate of applied pressure. What that means is if you run too much counterweight versus base, the counterweight can ramp in too quickly or vice versa. But at the end of the day, we also, that's a lot of uh, in lever design and things like that, which we try to do with our customers to make sure you're not getting the wrong thing to begin with. Um, real quick, something I wanted to do tonight is uh, let everybody know something. Uh, you know, with us, we're a family owned operation where, you know, we basically work with a lot of different clutch companies for design, development, different things along the ways because uh, that's the important thing to us. We found in the clutch world, it's a very tight knit community. Um, there's not that many of us in comparison. Um, and it's the thing where, you know, I was paralyzed as a lot of you guys know, and some of you don't know about actually five years ago this Friday, uh, running my mountain road pro stock car, West Palm beach. Luckily I can walk with a walker and got some very limited hand use. But at the end of the day, after that happened, um, everybody who's used to talking to us and calling the shop, they know there's a little person behind me known as Clutch Girl or the mother of clutches, which is Tenzi. 
Um, Tenzi's not a typical chick that answers the phone. And if anybody ever calls and calls her a secretary, be ready for the wrath because it's coming. Um, she usually means that she took a phone call. It usually meant she had to stop what she was doing out on a machine to actually uh, take the call. But she's happy to do it. She loves all it. One of her favorite people, by the way, is Don McClure because she sent, she sends her candy. So yeah, that's her. Uh, yeah, her one of her favorite. Um, so everybody knows that's something. You know, we are family owned, second generation. I grew up in this stuff since you know basically since I was very very little, kicked out of the shop. We still operate out of the small shop that uh, my dad ran Pro Stock out of back in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, but at the end of the day, that's our thing. It's pay attention to detail. I don't like uh, mass producing things. I'm not a fan of off the shelf stuff. Um, I'm a, even if it's a regular street car, we're going to go through it. We're going to look at what you're doing. We're going to choose what disc material and a pressure plate and everything that you need. It's not going to be a just this, this rating is for so much horsepower because to me, that's the dumbest thing in the world. I hate rating clutches. I hate rating fuel pumps. I hate rating anything that way because in the clutch world, for example, if I rate a clutch that's for 500 horsepower, a thousand horsepower, whatever, that all is very relative. It's relative to the weight of the car, the gear ratios of the car and things along those lines. So keep all that into, into perspective that that's what makes us what we are. We, everything, sometimes we're a little bit slower. Sometimes we, you know, but we're working, like I say, we burn the candle at both ends, but you can be guaranteed that we do everything we can to make sure it's right every single time. Um, and that's, you know, one of the most important things to us. So real quick, what we're going to do, um, we're going to jump over into our, um, bear with me one second. What we're going to do is jump over into our race pack information. Uh, let's see here. And then once we get to that point, uh, let's see here. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll get back to our race pack information and get in there exactly where we need to be in rel in relationship to, um, to what we're going to look at for on each sensor. So let's see here. Okay. Okay, let's see here, guys. What we're gonna do? Let's see here. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're gonna switch over here in just one second. Everybody bears with me. What we're gonna do is bring up out one of our race pack graphs. And I've got one queued up. This is gonna be kind of almost like a uh, make fun of me type session um, on my ability to. Let's see here. Okay. Share so everybody here can take a look. All right, so what we're going to do now is bring up a race pack graph here. This is actually one of my own runs from a long time ago, actually. Um, but what I'm really going to, we're going to walk through this graph specifically. And I'm going to bring up different things that I want you guys to be able to look at. Now, keep in mind, there's going to be a lot of things on this graph that you are not going to be able to obviously monitor because most people don't have this much uh, technology or sensors or things like that on their you know, normal car but it's going to allow me to show you why we look at what we look at on each thing. Okay. So basically what we're going to do is look at right here, as long as everybody can see where we're putting our cursor, what we're going to look at, we're, we're right at launch RPM of 5,366. So probably I had the chip set up probably about 5,300. Um, but what we're going to look at, and I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to start off real quick about showing everybody how to zero this. Now this graph has already technically been zeroed, but I'm going to show everybody what we would do to do it. Basically, we're going to click on the graph here just a little bit before the launch. Then what we're going to do is we're going to use our right arrow key on our keyboard to slack, slowly move to the right, watching the drive shaft RPM up at the top of the screen. All of a sudden, it will make a big jump. It made a 123 jump. If I take the left arrow back one, it goes back down to three. Now, this would be where we would zero this from. Okay, to zero it, we actually go down to the, on the left-hand side, it says uh, set start time. We'll click on the set start time and then click OK. What that does is that tells us that is the zero point. That is the point in which we uh, basically drop the clutch. Okay, so once we've dropped the clutch here, we're going to look at, to give you an idea here, actually, so everybody knows, uh, let's see, we will pull up the actual run information from this run. So that run, my light, which, oh, I guess I was really good, did not mean to pick this one, was 001, so I did something right that day. Uh, we went 983, 60 foot, 272 to the eighth, or to the 330, and a 419.9 to the, to the eighth mile. Not a stellar run by any means, um, and we'll go in and I'll pick that apart as to why that was. Um, and I can tell you right now, anybody walked into one of these cars graphs, you're going to look at the clutch is a little bit on the loose side. 
So basically what we're going to look at here is, is I'm shifting this, I'm targeting shifting this, this car at this time at about 8,000 RPM, maybe 8,100. I short shifted this one just a little bit. Um, not too bad, but you know, a little bit early. But what you have to look at is, is the clutch lockup is really going to be about right there. So that's at about 7,000, 7,100, uh, which normally is pretty good. The problem is, as you can see, when I short shifted this thing by 200 RPM, it brought up a pretty big little window right here between the one and two. That's a pretty big uh, split actually to have. So that's a little bit more than we want. So to fix this run going forward, obviously we're going to add clutch to it. The problem you got to keep in mind is, you know, do you add, everybody's going to ask, do I add base? Do I add counterweight? What do I add? Well, that's the thing you got to look at. A lot of people always, you know, the old school way is, hey, base does everything. Well, in this thing, I can tell you right now, we took base away from it and we added a significant amount of counterweight. So everybody's going to say, well, why did you take base away from it? Well, it's really simple because I still have to worry about this number over here, which is launch RPM. This is where I left. So if I were to just say add, and I can tell you just from experience, that would have taken about nine grams to get it where I wanted it to on this particular clutch, which by the way, we would run anywhere between 140 and 180 grams on a car like this a lot of times. So some guys run them differently. This is just my stuff per se, uh, so, you know, several years back, but as an example, I would have added about nine grams. The nine grams would have given me, you know, probably in the neighborhood of about 300 pounds of extra plate load pressure, which would have locked the clutch up about 200 RPM sooner. So if I added that extra uh, counterweight, it would have given me a lot more pressure also at launch RPM. So to offset that, we take a little bit of base pressure away from it, knowing that now the counterweight is actually going to come in more quickly. So even though we want more pressure at the lockup up high at high RPM, we don't necessarily want that much more low RPM because a 980, 160 foot is nothing horrible. Um, you know, it's still well within where we need to be. So going back to the drive shaft RPM, I want to see, show you. So what we will do here, we will move until we select. And I usually, you can't get exact. So what I'm going to have you guys look at right here in the top left corner of the black screen part, it'll say 2.246. If I move rides to 0.257, but we're looking at approximately the quarter second mark. At a quarter of a second, this car had 1,200 drive shaft RPM. These cars, just experience, 1,800 RPM is about what you would see, want to see drive shaft RPM at that point. So it's 600 soft, which going back to it, we know we didn't, you know, we could have hit it harder. We know we're soft. We already knew that we need to apply more pressure. So let's move on out here to a half of a second. These are the numbers that all of you can look at. This is something how you target different racetracks. You figure things out. This is the most important part is realize that what you do with that clutch, what you do with the gear ratio, what you do with the launch RPM, the shock settings, all of that is what's controlling this drive shaft RPM. By targeting drive shaft RPM to do the same thing every time, once you find what your car likes for 60 foot, you know what you need to do with it to get back there. So here we have 1,755 drive shaft RPM. So I was 600 RPM slow at a quarter second. Here I'm almost 1,000 drive shaft RPM low from my target. So once again, we know that the clutch has slipped a little too much. So now to bring up a little bit more information, something I want to show you guys that most of you don't see on your race packs or in your data loggers, this is our shock, shock travel sensors on the back. So that's the right rear that I just brought up. So what you'll see, for example, on this car is we're setting at about 3.53, which is right height. Um, that's where it sets, you know, as the car is just sitting on the starting line. When you drop the clutch, obviously you're going to see a little bit of a bump that goes up, which is typically, you know, totally normal. That's where you, it shocks the tire, basically. And then it starts to drive it, drive the tire down into the racetrack. As it drives the tire down into the racetrack, we've gone down to 2.97. So if we go back, you basically can say, hey, you've dropped a little over about six tenths of an inch, give or take. Okay. Not really as much as I normally want, but on this particular track, the track was actually very, very good. And that's what pulled the clutch out of it a little bit too much. And I kind of knew it was. So the way we were running the shocks was basically trying to not let the rear end drop, not basically not squat it too much. That that actually puts more load on the clutch. So what we're looking at is here, we try to on these cars, and different people have different theories on this. Um, I you know, and I've played with them all. Um, but to give you an idea, this way we run this is see we're coming back up close to ride height, somewhere in about the you know the first part to the middle of second gear. And with, a, with our stuff, obviously, we start obtaining enough uh, actual ground speed on out here. You can see it's starting to push, and as we'll, as we'll go out here, it'll start to push the rear end back down. That's obviously from downforce and the speed of the car. Because by third gear, we're running well, you know, well over, say, 120 to 130 miles an hour really easily. Uh, we cross the eighth mile with these cars usually somewhere 
it, actually I said we're way over that because the eighth mile we're put, you know, we're turning a say anywhere between 172 to 100 and say 80 mile an hour, just depending on what the air, the conditions, the horsepower you're making, whatever. So by out here, we're getting enough down pressure to kind of fix that. But going back, what I want everybody to see is this this drop, this initial drop. If I were to make that less, it would actually allow the clutch to not have as much load on it. You would get wheel speed easier that by basically letting there be less compression. Now, if I put more compression, meaning let that back, let that thing drop, it's going to plant that tire even harder. When it plants that tire even harder, it's going to pull the clutch out of it even harder. So now, while we've got this information up, I'm going to pull up a lateral G or sorry, an Excel G meter. An Excel G meter, basically what we're looking at, this is also how we determine shift points. A lot of times, obviously everybody's got a dyno sheet and you're going to have a speculation where you should shift. I've had a lot of engines over the years, you know, the Kazi's done for me, for example, that, you know, we look at on the dyno and it's like, man, we can shift. I remember my old Outlaw 10 five car was a 698 inch uh, four headed, really neat motor. It's actually kind of one of my pride and joys. Uh, but that basically the interesting thing about it though was, you know, the thing made power look good. That thing should have been shifted to 8,800. Um, we found 83, 8,400 was really on the G meter what it liked. I mean, it had a really nice power band. It was really nice. You know, it was really smooth. But what you have to look at out here is basically where it's what it's doing to the G meter is it is it holding it up here and that's actually between the high point here and this peak right here that's actually fairly good it's a fairly average but the reason that it stays up there like that is because the clutch is driving in very very slow so it's kind of holding it um, really what you should see is this first peak should be just a little bit higher um, and then basically it shouldn't fall it should fall a little quicker but it should have started a little higher but all these things are what you go to look back into to try to figure out what kind of a load the clutch had on it and you to get on any given time. So um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch back here in just a second. Um, and what we're going to do is start basically uh, talking a little bit more, taking some questions. Um, I got a few here. So one thing I wanted to say was about my my favorite, you know, yellow SN95 twin turbo Mustang. This guy over here is a crew member and he keeps saying this guy named Yandro. Um, then it's this really fast car that for some reason just constantly runs good numbers and has for a long time and started doing stuff that, uh, evidently he woke up a bunch of people that, uh, you know, back when they said that there was no way that that car could ever go in the sevens. Um, you know, he woke them all up, got a bunch of guys digging their, their pocketbook and, uh, it took him a little while, but, uh, now I got a feeling he's, uh, he's probably itching just a little bit. So, um, another question is when playing with counterweight, uh, What's a good amount of uh, amount to add or subtract each try? Um, and I, by the way, I know who this is, and it's uh, David. And I don't, I've never pronounced your last name, which I'm going to assume I'm going to try to do it properly. Um, so is your Um But basically, the way to answer that question, um, it depends on the clutch. It depends on how much you've got to begin with. So once again, like I was talking about our mountain motor pro stock stuff, and knowing that you're going to be running small diameter billet stuff. Um, you've got to look at how much you have as a total. So obviously if I'm running 140 grams of counterweight, three grams probably isn't going to be a big swing. Um, but if I'm running 36 grams as a total counterweight, three grams is a pretty good swing. So it really just depends on where we start with you. So most, I will touch on this because I think it's a good point. Most of my long style guys, guys running the next gen or guys running any of our typical long styles, a lot of them are running horsepowers between 400 and 1,000 horsepower. Uh, they're weighing 2,500 to 3,400 pounds. Uh, their gear ratios are relative to where they need to be. So what I'm looking at is um, we usually want to try to get them, let's say, in the, let's say most of them are at somewhere between 20 grams and 40 grams is their number. Most of them are going to play with a three-gram swing. Um, at a time if they're close. If they're close, you're going to do, say, on a three-lever clutch, you're going to do one gram per, you know, every lever. On a billet clutch, like what your stuff is, you know, it just depends on where we end up with it. But the long story short, I guess, is really that it's all going to depend on how much we have total. So it's really more of a percentage thing. So if you kind of figure that, you know, um, three grams on, you know, of 36 grams is a ninth, uh, you know, or basically it's a little close, you know, just a little under the the 10% range of total pressure. That's a pretty decent swing. So what we have to look at there is, you know, that's a small adjustment. If you did six, six grams there, that would be a pretty big adjustment, but we also want to keep it as a, as a, a fairly good balance between base and counterweight. Um, basically, um, you know, there's another question also, and I, I kind of want to, 
I do want to address this. There's another question that came in that I definitely wanted to uh, touch on um, that had to do with 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 tires. Um, I think that's a good point to bring up. A lot of people have been asking me different things about tire size. They also get into the radial versus the bias ply slick, uh, things like that. That's a very deep, intricate topic, but to touch on it briefly. Um, the, the radials can be very fast. They can be very stable, and a lot of guys like them for that. However, the slick can be too if the suspension and everything else is done properly. That's something to, to really you know get into. Um, basically, the slick is going to be more consistent on launch from track to track without the changes. Track prep with the slick is a lot a lot easier to do the same thing with every time. Um, the radial is going to – with the stick stuff – it just has to do with you. Once again, it comes back to maintaining that wheel speed. If you go to a track and the track prep is a lot better versus a lot worse, you may have to adjust something in there to kind of get your wheel speed back where it needs to be. And the adjustments may be a little bit trickier to hit just how you want, but it's totally doable. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can run the suspension one way or the other. The other point that I really want to get back into um, is back to tire size. So if we're talking to slicks, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of guys, I'm sure all of you are used to them, or you have the older guys that you're friends friends with, that they go out there and they're still running tubes in the car, you know, in these things. Um, that's not a good, the only thing tubes are good for is the guy that's got rim screws or bead locks or whatever. And basically he is too lazy or she, I oh, should back up. I got Autumn Green out there and plenty of others. Um, and Trista Fenner, by the way. So I'm going to be careful, but Tr Trista's within driving distance. Um, is basically... The tubes are just kind of a no-no um, for what we're doing. The tubes are, they have their place and their purposes, but it's basically because you're too lazy to put air in the tires every once in a while or put the thing up on jack stands when you're home. Um, you're going to find a good stiff sidewall slick. And, you know, don't get me wrong, the big three out there, the Goodyear, the Hoosier, and the Mickey Thompson, how I personally have always viewed them. Um, and obviously I've done stick, small tire stick shift racing to Outlaw 10.5, to big tire pro stock pro mod type stuff. Um, the thing I've always found, and this is kind of the best rule of thumb, the Goodyear's very, very, very um, good with um, the structure of the tire. The compounds for the small tire guys, not as good. The Hoosier kind of seems to be in the middle on both, and the Mickey kind of is the exact opposite of the Goodyear. The Mickey has a really good, like, compound, but the uh, the structure of the tire is basically a little bit softer. But that's why their stiff sidewall works really good. So if you're a car, you know, 2,500 to a 3,400 pound car, you're running a 28, 10.5, a 29 and a half, 10, 5, a 31. Um, you know, you don't need, you need you run the stiff sidewalls, do not put tubes in them, uh, makes a hell of a difference. Um, so, you know, the, there's a few different things. Look, I do want to back up here to catch one question that I totally forgot. I don't want to overlook him uh, as Dennis Crop. Uh, like I said, Dennis actually was one of my, uh, a long time ago, actually came, actually I say it was a long time ago, about three years ago now. Uh, came into one of our clutch tuning seminars out at JSC Racing out in uh, out in Pennsylvania. Um, he's got a 396 inch stocker uh, Nova. Um, he runs one of our 10 inch next gen units in it. Um, and you know, he's asking basically how far do you push the launch RPM? You know, basically how can you? And what you have to keep in mind that's actually a really good question and it's something I should really talk about here. Um, what, if your launch RPM when you depending on how obviously it's how much horsepower you make. If your car has the ability to accelerate upon launch, so if you're looking at a race pack graph and you see the launch RPM and then all of a sudden it goes ahead, once you drop the clutch, it accelerates, then you've got to look at two things. You don't want that launch RPM to be so high that it's getting close to your, uh, your basically your shift point. So if you launch, like he's talking about theirs, you know, he's talking 5,500 launch RPM. And if he was shifting at, say, 7,500, that's only a 2,000 RPM window. So what happens if you shift at 7,500 and the engine drops 1,500, you're probably going to drop below your lockup RPM, which is obviously good because you get a little slippage in the clutch, in the gear shifts, but it's probably going to be a little bit too much. So it's in, it's very important to get your ratios to where they work properly so that when you're launching at one area, it's driving out here into the other area. That's the most important thing to look at. Dennis's combination is a little bit interesting in the fact that I, I, I hate to, I, I think probably his thing is, is he look at his horsepower to weight ratio with his ratios. Obviously, everybody out there is different. Everybody's not going to go out and buy a different transmission. They're not like a pro car. They're not re-gearing this thing every round or, hell, even twice a season or once a season. It's what they, they, what they have is what they've got. But choosing that, that's when it goes back to, that's where we have, it has to load on the clutch. If you get it, say, 5,500 RPM, you're launching and you're shifting at 75, we might, would, you know, we might need to look at a couple different things there. It means we would probably need to look at 
can we take a little bit of gear or put a little more first gear ratio with it to help so that we don't have to launch it as high so that we have more RPM to work with on the on that. That that makes a big difference there. So that's something that we can always play with. But that's where I go back to saying that it has to do with the balance. Everything's a balance. There's not a right way to do this and there's not a wrong way to do it. The thing I'll probably tell everybody out there is, you know, I always bring back to Pro Stock because let's face it, that's the most consistent stick cars on the planet. Uh, you know, and the interesting thing is we pull the things apart every round. We're changing ratios every round. We're trying something every round. The cars still were within a very little bit. I've seen cars that come off of a jig at the same shop, say at Haas's shop, that, you know, same almost clone motors, clone everything. And you can do the exact, you can put everything I, exactly the same in both cars and they will not act exactly the same. Just won't do it. And so basically what you've got to look at there is you got to give each, you got to give the car what it wants. Giving the car what it wants is probably the most important thing you'll ever do. Um, so the best way to also put it, it also means there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, you know, there's not always the hundred percent right way to do it. There's what somebody has as, you know, as, you know, as that opportunity. So, you know, basically there's different ways to get there, but sometimes what works for one person may work better for another. Um, you know, so Les Kane is asking, uh, what's an acceptable amount of shifts uh, or slip on the sh on the gear shifts? That also is a little bit of a uh, variance. So five speed versus four speed is going to be a little bit of a difference. But this is actually a good opportunity to bring up gear ratios from starting line to finish line. Starting line to finish line is a big difference. So um, a lot of times I've had this argument uh, with uh, a transmission manufacturer that I'm actually really good friends with, uh, but I won't say his name so he doesn't uh, throw something at me through virtual reality here. Um, but basically, you know, gear splits being perfectly even for every car, not really optimal. And the reason I'll explain that is the, the less horsepower to weight ratio you have, meaning like a stock eliminator car versus a pro stock car, you know, you're way heavier. You don't have near the horsepower and the torque. Uh, you just don't have the, the, the tools to work with. So the best way to explain this is on those type cars, is it people ask, is it where, what, what's the gear splits going to be? What's good for that? So the best way to explain this um, is you, with the way I tune them, I want a bigger gear split in the, say, 3.4 than I want in the 1.2. Because in the 3.4, I have ground speed to help make up for that. If I separate the clutch a little bit too much in the 3.4, that car has got ground speed to help make up for it. Versus So lugging it a little bit, it's not bad. We did that years ago with a lot of the Aussie Pro Stock cars when Tenzi and I would go down, we'd do some tuning. Um, you know, it was basically, they had nice, perfect, even gear splits. And then, you know, we had a chance to show them, Hey, we don't want to work with the ratios we're working with here. We don't have that much torque. We have 400 cubic inches to work with. That thing does not have torque for the, you know, for a big 17 inch wide slick out back. So you have to work with what you've got. So to answer the question of slippage in the gear changes, most cars, um, you know, and less knowing what your stuff is off the top of my head, um, you know, probably you would be trying to target somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's say, about five to seven percent would be about optimal, um, you know, for your car. Uh, the thing is, makes it tough to hit that is the size tire that you would potentially run, things like that. What I always look at is, is look at your drive shaft RPM. And when looking at your drive shaft RPM, notice that the engines or the tire spike that you get, you're really just trying to minimize that. A lot of our cars are old small tire, our old back in the day hot street stuff. Um, that we had some certain limitations of what we were allowed to run. We usually built ignition programs to the digital seven box. Obviously now we can, we got a lot more options out there, uh, you know, with power grid, things like that. So basically what we're looking at here is we are um, trying to eliminate that tire spike. And another way to do that, sometimes you can't literally get that slippage out of it. You, I mean, without changing the ratios every run, you're just not going to be perfect on that combination. So a lot of times what we can actually do is go in and pull a little bit of timing on a gear change. And there's ways to do that and build that in. And I'm more than happy to teach any of our customers and friends and anybody that wants you know, information on that. We can either do that one-on-one -on -one at any given time, or you know, I'm more than happy to uh, work with anybody. We can do a session on that as well. Um, Another one is uh, Martin Gerard, or uh, yeah, our fellow from up north. Um, basically, um, you know, he's asking a two to four, two four or an eight magnet on a drive shaft sensor. Um, you know, do they make? Do they basically have the same race pack reading? So you got to calibrate any sensor that you've got. So basically, anytime you have a sensor, and this is obviously whether you're running drive shaft or engine RP, whatever you're running, it's a rotational uh, pickup. So if it's programmed to have uh, one magnet when it goes around. Um, and it sees eight magnets go around, whatever readouts you get, it's going to be eight times faster. Um, so if it says 100 RPM, or if it's really 100 RPM, it's going to say it's 800 RPM. That's just how that's going to work. Um, so that's the thing you have to understand with any of that. Personally speaking,